J.R.R. Tolkien was a, um, an Oxford Don who wrote and told stories to his children that then became some of the most popular and most beloved um, stories in Western literature. When The Hobbit was published in 1937, it was quite a success. And Tolkien's publisher said, please write more about Hobbits. And Tolkien did start uh, on a sequel immediately, um, but it became something much darker, much more adult, and much longer. It became The Lord of the Rings. He'd been writing a whole history and, and background to the Middle Earth for 40 odd years. And then this great book appears, which sits on top of it and provides you with a story. But at the same time, as he was writing prose and poetry versions of the same tales, he was painting the most beautiful watercolours to illustrate those tales. If we can open it up the mount, oh we can word. see the actual size. It's just exquisite. I love the movement in it. There's, there's the rushing water here coming off the mill wheel. It's a huge privilege to have in the Bodleian's collections the Tolkien archive. Well, he's not really known as an artist, and perhaps some people would have looked at the illustrations and The Hobbit and, you know, be surprised that he's actually done them himself. I've always enjoyed his artwork, always loved it, and always found it useful because, well, as an illustrator, I'm trying to get into the author's mind as much as possible. And, and, obviously do that through the text, but be able to go a little bit further and to look at the artwork that he was creating and just see more clearly what was in his mind. Sometimes it's hard to tell which comes first. Is it the illustration and then the text, or does the text come first and then the illustration? Certainly the two are working in tandem and uh, seem incredibly important to Tolkien's visualisation of the scenes that he's writing about. It was all part of creating a kind of a total sort of artistic expression of this kind of ancient mythology that he invented. Some of the, uh, the landscapes, he has inspired, you know, e ecologists and people like that because of the way he, he, he thought that nature had a voice. What worried him was the, the senseless destruction of nature, which he'd witnessed from a boy as he grew up through really the 20th century. There's film clips of him walking through Merton College, looking at where the trees used to be and talking about how there used to be these wonderful trees in there. So am I right in thinking that we're, we're heading to a destination that is of major importance to J.R.R. Tolkien? <laughs> so, uh, the Mutton Stone Table, which is a spot where he would commune uh, with one of the other Inklings, uh, Lewis. It was actually Lewis's inspiration for the Stone Table in Narnia. This is somewhere where they would go and talk and hash out all of their ideas. Imagine if you knew you were going to write these books and you knew that someone was going to come here several years later and pop a ring down in your name. Tolkien started inventing languages uh, when he was a, a young boy. And he said that, you know, that's what came first, inventing a language, and then he wanted a world to set those languages in. I think somebody's tried to decipher that, and it is a curse against somebody who steals the gold. All right, yeah. <laughs> and then you can create names in those languages, and you can create concepts, you can create ideas that are difficult to translate from one language to another. It, in fact, it's impossible to conceive that he would have written The Lord of the Rings without being a professor of Anglo-Saxon. It, it's just all gone into the uh, writing of his fiction. We can see that he's taken some of the themes from Beowulf, the old English epic poem that he taught as an academic at Oxford for over 20 years. It's hard to imagine his writing without Beowulf. Beowulf is there all the time, somewhere. First forth ye wat, flotta was on Uthen, but under Beoga, Beon as Yarwe, on Stevden, Stegon. It's this attitude of, of courage in adversity, which is one of the messages which Tolkien and, and people like C.S. Lewis in The Inklings thought was really a real contribution of this kind of ancient literature. The little people, in the case of The Hobbits, literally do stand up in that sense to take on the great armies of darkness and they defeat them. <laughs> <laughs> 
And that's what he was trying to say, that you can stand up and take on evil, and there is a chance it will be defeated. He always said he despised allegory in all its forms, and he hated the idea that people would read this kind of symbolism into his works. But you, you look at huge amounts of what he wrote, especially parts of the summary, and you think, this is clearly inspired by your experiences in the war. This horrible, mechanized destruction of human life. What he was seeing through that first half of the 20th century was a passing of the old world as we moved into the new world. And the whole of Middle-earth, particularly in The Lord of the Rings, is filled with a similar tone, this sense of passing. The third age of Middle-earth will go. Once the ring is destroyed, all the beauty that the elves had created will begin to fade and diminish, and then and the men, men will take over. So there's this sense of, of, of an elegy overriding the entire book. Roads go ever, ever on, over rock and under tree. By caves where never sun has shone, by streams that never find the sea. Over snow by winter sown, and through the merry flowers of June. Over grass and over stone, and under mountains in the moon. Roads go ever, ever on, under cloud and under star. Yet feet that wandering have gone, turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in the halls of stone. Look at last on meadows green, and trees and hills they long have known.